Whether it's bad planning, bad luck, bad timing, or bad inventions, well-intentioned bad decisions have plagued history for thousands of years. Welcome to Historic Hindsight. Hello and welcome to Historic Hindsight. I'm John, that's Tom. Today we are going to talk to you about pirates. Badass pirates, Johnny. Or well, just one pirate in particular, Well, yeah, right? one pirate in particular, yeah. I'm excited and, for this and, one. And probably, uh, first off, it's a woman, so that's that's awesome. And, and she probably goes down, she should at least go down as the most successful pirate. It, it, in all times, every list that I've looked at, she was she's the she, tops. on the tops. Yeah. yeah, yeah, she's she's a badass. So her name is uh, Ching Shi. Uh, she's she's the pirate queen who uh, is a strong, independent woman who don't need no man, Johnny. Uh, and and like I said, quite possibly the most successful pirate ever. Yeah. So uh, so she was born Shi Yang in 1775 in the Gongzhou uh, uh, city of Gongzhou in the Gongdong province, uh, which is under the Xing Dynasty. Um, and her exact birth date is unknown, and we're pre- we're pretty sure it's in 1775. Well, that's all right. I'm super familiar with the rest of that information. With the rest so of I, all I that information. I kind of got a good picture you, of what's you, going yeah, on. Yeah, you don't... Uh, you, you took Chinese history, Johnny, in college. You don't remember <laughs> sure any of that? No. And we no. focused a shit ton on the, on, the, on the Xing Dynasty. A lot of crap happened uh, during that time in China. So, basically, this is the time when China's really being discovered as a, as a world entity right. you know silk trades kicking on and we're about ready to have the everything. opium wars because you know we yep. need our opiums in the west i mean so uh her early life uh is there's not a lot known about her early life but we pick up knowledge on her when she becomes a cantonese prostitute um who will wind up working her way up to the madam status uh and she earns the nickname shi huang ku um so which i believe already just you can see leadership yeah in her i mean yeah. you know she goes and gets a job and all of and all of, you know works her way to the top right away yep yep uh and she works on the uh on what are called, what's called a floating brothel so basically it's a brothel on a boat that would service the south china sea which is very uh at this point in time in china it's a very almost like its own wild west nation kind of thing think yeah. of the american wild west there aren't really rules or structure down there. right yeah it's hard to govern over a bunch of ships that just kind of move around and float around and do their trading and everything. Yeah, yeah, exactly. And uh, but it's here where she learns her skills for spying, deception, political gain, strategy, uh, all all which is done through pillow talk. So she basically learns how to. <laughs> One of my favorite <laughs> things throughout history is that forever women have been using sex to get information and what they want out of men, and it has worked forever. And she becomes like a supreme master of this yeah uh in 1801 she would meet and marry uh shang yacht who is uh one of the foremost pirates of the area at that time okay so she saw an opening and saw a leader and she's like what's up like uh (laughs) Go ahead and take this over. Yep, yep. So a little bit of information about Cheng. Uh, he is, uh, he's also known as Zhang Yi. Uh, and he was, a, like I said, he was a famous pirate. Why, uh, why does everybody have multiple names? Um, so in is China, that, yeah, it... yeah. So in China, basically, you, you have your birth name, but as you marry or as you gain titles, things change. Okay. So your first name is often like the familial name, um, which is why she... Uh, she stands like you know right. her nickname was Shi Huang Ku, but she was born Shi Hyang, and her her final name is Ching Shi. Um, so that there are some familial names that will always stay. But basically, as you gain title, as you marry, okay. like it, it all. So it your all name changes. says more about you than just your name. It's yeah, like I believe. Don't quote me on this, but I believe her nickname, like Shi Huang Ku, is like essentially Madam Prostitute. Right. Okay. Of this family or whatever i'll buy it um but but chang yacht he was uh he was a pirate uh part of a pirating family that uh, dated all the way back to the mid 17th century uh and they gave themselves a royal title so basically these were royalty of pirates that go all the way back to like the mid 1600s it was like 100 years ago the 17th century for them oh for yeah 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 so, the, so this like is a years. this is a so hundred like year dynasty three yeah 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 like that. They're so clearly successful because if you're able yeah, to survive I mean, that long, a pirate, yeah, yeah, yeah no. you, haven't, you haven't been screwed over. Uh, and he has actually becomes an instrumental part of the Xing Dynasty's government intrigue, which is where basically China paid mercenary pirates 
to go fuck shit up elsewhere. Yeah. Uh, and was he was very instrumental in China's intervention into Vietnam. Which again, I'm an American and I don't know anything about geography. Vietnam is just south of China. Yeah. Yeah. I thought it was like an island somewhere, but I'm uh, retarded. Well, well, that, that's so, Japan. I learned the, I learned this for the Philippines. If, if nothing else. <laughs> Uh, Ching Shi uh, uh, gained uh, Cheng Yat's attention through her fame. So uh, basically, yeah, as like the best prostitute ever, and he's like, I I want to go the see best the best prostitute, prostitute ever, ever yeah. please, because I'm the best pirate that's going right now. So historical record is unclear because there are multiple angles here. There's like the family of Cheng Yat. There's the pirates that followed him, and everybody has a different interpretation of how they met, why they met, and why they Man, got married. This is this is nothing more. This is two powerful people getting together to be more powerful people. Well, and and so th that's there. There are basically the two uh, agreed upon theories of why Cheng Yat proposed marriage. It was either because he was infatuated with her, you know, <laughs> with beauty probably, and skills, yeah. which yeah, and yeah. skills. And he saw her as a, you know, her skills at political intrigue and strategy and wanted her as an ally. Right. Both. Yes. It's both. Right. Yeah, I mean, yeah. Absolutely. I mean, yeah. Why can't it be both either? You know, yeah, you, and, you can love someone for multiple reasons. Yeah, exactly. And, and I guarantee you it's both because uh, a part of this marriage agreement, uh, Ching Shi worked out 50% uh, ownership of all the pirate enterprises of Shang Yat. Which is unheard Wait. of. A, it's unheard of at this time in the Xing Dynasty. You want to make bets on when they were having those conversations and doing that uh, negotiation? <laughs> negotiation. Uh, <laughs> pre and post <laughs> pillow talk. So, all right. Well, I'll I'll be open to it, but let's get this other business out of the way. And oh, see how good that was. Yeah. If you want oh, more and, of that, uh, yes. Yeah, so I want fifty percent. Yeah. Let's talk about this ownership. But, yeah, but it, it, I got to stress that this is unheard of at this time for a woman in Confucian society in the Qing Dynasty to be able to own anything, let alone 50% ownership of a massive enterprise. And right. again, pirate in the, the Chinese South Sea at this time, Qing Yat is actually a legitimate, and I use that in right. quotes, uh, uh, merchant mercenary. Yeah, I mean, yeah, it was a big thing that just like it was they did business and stuff with governments. Like, yeah. like it was a, it was a basically a profession yeah yeah you he was a, like given a a legal right by china to rape and pillage vietnam yeah. kind of like what we did yeah just stay away stay, just stay away from our people and go get them and that's fine yep uh in exchange uh she would lend her prowess of intrigue and strategy and once married uh she took the name sheng yatso which is literally a translation of wife of chang yeah okay um so a little bit it's, about their and so begins her name career. changes and all that fun well, stuff. And so begins her pirate. yeah her career as a pirate. So um, so Cheng Shi would participate fully in all of her husband's pirate enterprises. Uh, in eighteen oh one, Cheng Ya and Cheng Shi would adopt a fellow pirate by the name of uh, Cheng Po. Um, like adopt as a child. Yeah, adopt okay. as a child. Uh, so what happens is uh, Cheng Po was born in seventeen eighty three to a son of a fisherman and would be abducted by Cheng Yat and part of his prison, you know, or oh, pirate so that's enterprises. How they adopted him. Well, he, he was abducted <laughs> uh, in seventeen ninety eight and he was pressed into service as a pirate. Fun, funny but, how close those words are. Yeah, yeah, right. But uh, he was a very good pirate. Like his natural talents helped him rise the ranks. And then, you know, actually by the time they adopt him, he's he's an adult. But right, they wanted well, right, an heir. Yeah, yeah. yeah. And, Basically, it's more. Think of it more as not necessarily. They I'm adopting you as a captive. son. They pick their favorite captive yeah. to run the shit. Run yeah, the <laughs> exactly, exactly. So uh, later, the couple would actually have two of their own biological children, um, Cheng Tin Shi and uh, Cheng Huang Shi. Again, sorry guys at home. I'm doing my best with these names. I think I'm okay. <laughs> I don't I mean, know. I, I, it's not like I can help. <laughs> yeah, right. Um, I, I, when I did take Chinese history, I literally thought I was reading the wrong material because the names did not match up with how the professor was pronouncing them. Yeah, how these names are spelled does not look at like how I'm necessarily saying them. Um, by 1802, the official mercenary license of uh, China gave uh, uh, Cheng Yat... Uh, it actually winds up expiring because the conflict in Vietnam ends. So at this point, all those mercenary licenses are, are coming up due. So these all these old pirate fleets are now coming back to the South China Sea to, well, they're supposed to disarm and just reintegrate into society. Yeah, which, of course. 
Uh, easy, easy enough. <laughs> but unfortunately, at the same time that they're returning from Vietnam, um, they find that that China's engaged in uh, uh, what's called the Lotus Rebellion. So, oh shoot, more wars. More wars. So the whatever the, will they do? <laughs> right. So the White Lotus Rebellion was an anti-tax protest slash rebellion that was led by a, a secret religious group known as the White Lotus Society, and essentially they're just a bunch of Buddhists that have uh, herbal heal healing powers and are super badass martial artists. So cool. they said, we don't need no government. We don't want no government. And they create this massive rebellion in the Qing dynasty in China. And so when the pirates came back, they're like, you know what? Instead of disarming, I'm just going to rape and pillage the shit <laughs> out of the South China Sea because who's going to stop me? The Qing uh, yeah, government's too busy dealing with this rebellion. Yeah. We're just going to have free reign. P.S. Uh, China really knows how to name stuff. White Lotus Rebellion's a dope name. It sounds pretty badass. It does. The um, White Lotus Society. <laughs> right? So uh, so obviously the raping and pillaging begins. Um, it gets to the point where it's so bad that there are actually six major fleets that begin operating in the seas after the Vietnam conflict. Um, and Ching Shi uh, and Chang Ya wind up ruling what's known as the Red Flag Fleet, which is the largest of all the fleets. And uh, they're bolstered through the hundred years of Chang Yat's family ties, yeah, and, along with a bunch of sailors coming back from the war. Plus, they get a lot of recruits from the the basically the port cities in South China. They're like, "I'm starving. Yeah, There's no more land to farm. Let me, uh, I'll, so I'll, let me this, help you." Is is it at this point where the the kind of pirate fleet that she has is the largest ever? No, Assembled, no, it, 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 it gets, it, gets it, it'll get bigger than this. Um, but currently it's, it's one of the largest fleets that has ever it's been running, assembled. It's running and it is the, everything yeah. in the, in the Chinese. Yeah, yeah we'll, we'll get there, but her fleet does become a lot more substantial. So, uh, obviously these, these fleets that are pirates that aren't, you know, they don't all have the best code of ethics here, wind up inter competing with each other and then fighting with each other. Shocking. Um, shocking, right? Um, but with the maneuvering of Chang Yat and Chang Shi, uh, they use their personal and familial obligations to unite the fleets uh, underneath them. And in 1805, they would wind up actually solidifying a pirate alliance uh, through mutual beneficial gains. So basically, they kind of sat down all the pirates and said, hey, look, instead of fighting each other, why don't we all pool our resources <laughs> and, and just, fight someone else? just screw the shit out of China? <laughs> Go, I mean... Look at, well, I mean, at this point, they're starting to realize that they're getting big enough. Because for you know, oh, the yeah. longest time, they, it, it would have been ridiculous to try to take on a, the, you know, a country's navy. Yeah, but at, yeah. This, but point, at this point, they are, like, they are substantially uh, larger than China's and realize, navy. realize, uh, guys, we kind of got the numbers here. We can, yeah, we can do some serious pirating. At this point in 1805, when they, when they make their alliance, like, they are the, they're the fleet. There's yeah. nothing that can touch them. Which again, 1805 is weird to think of pirates still being like rampant in 1805 because, oh, yeah. like, you know, out in the Caribbean and stuff, that you know, we think of Blackbeard and stuff, and that was like 1600s, 1700s. Right. By 1800, it kind of started to die out. But in China, well, it's, it's booming. You know, it's one of those things where you just take a look at what's going on elsewhere in the world, and it's weird to, you know, to think about. You know, America had already you know been a, become a country. Yeah, at that time, and, like, and to think about pirates while America's a country, yeah, yeah, it, it is just... weird. Yeah, um, time is subjective, I guess, right? It's a flat circle. That um, makes sense. But unfortunately, this this group alliance would would see its very first major hiccup when, on November sixteenth, eighteen o seven, Cheng Yat would die in Vietnam during a typhoon and subsequently falling overboard. Oh no! So you know, Cheng Yat's dead now. So the the head huh. the head of the uh, the, the head of the whole pirating enterprise half from 1805 or half the half head the half man. the head of the whole pirating enterprise pirating, which i which i think is important it is important <laughs> yes all right sorry <laughs> half half uh so but you know cheng shi is a woman so how is that going to go over with the rest of the pirate fleet and this is where some maneuvering and stuff happens. So initially, there's a little bit of speculation by opponents of Cheng Shi that her and her adopted son, Cheng Po, actually killed Cheng Ya. <gasps> right? She Intrigue. wouldn't. She wouldn't. Uh, rumors aren't exactly helped when within weeks of uh, Cheng Ya's death, her and Cheng Po become lovers. So uh, The grieving process brought them together, likely. Uh, yeah, but in reality, what she was doing here was actually a smart move. Uh, Cheng Po was the second, you know, was the heir to Cheng Shi. 
was also the second kind of most powerful pirate in the seas. By aligning herself with him, it solidifies power in her own fleet. Uh, she, by aligning herself with him, she actually gets the family ties from Cheng Yat and gets them on board. And then uh, Cheng Po is very much infatuated with Cheng Shi. You don't say. Yeah, very much so. Uh, <laughs> to the point where uh, with pirate, like not wanting to follow a woman, she would give him the title of captain but would maintain the overarching control. So she, he would be in charge of the fleet. She would be in charge of the entire enterprise. Yeah, like she's like, she's this, she's Cleopatra. She is, she is very much Cleopatra of, of China. Very, very much so. Uh, and Cheng Po would follow her orders like dutifully to the end. Like he was, yeah. was 100% loyal to her. And any male crew member that wasn't open to a woman ruler, he'd put in place pretty damn quickly. Like, yeah, we'll get there, Johnny. We'll oh, get there. Okay. I don't want to ruin it just yet. Uh, so in order to also uh, obtain unity in her fleet, she gets the support of all the chieftains uh, through the Chang Yat's family and uh, also gets the heads of each other individual fleets to support her. Again, through mutual gains, mutual benefits, because at this point, um, Cheng Shi has established herself as kind of like the head mafia boss because not only are we raping and pillaging pirating like you know going off and seeing what gold we can get from other merchant vessels and that kind of stuff she's spread her enterprises into the opium trade into the sea you know the fish trade the legit... into the salt trade like she's got her hands in all major massive merchant you know anything merchant related in the south china seas it's it's owned by her yeah the logistics behind all of this, all of the communication between all of these pirate fleets, all of the, you know, the coordination and everything else is insane when you think about the scale of it all. Yeah. And, and, and what she's doing and how she is just like, you know, she's, the, you know, playing with the, the string. She's a marionette. Yeah. You know, and this is why she should go down as one of the major reasons why she should go down as the most successful, because, you know, you don't hear about Blackbeard having this massive pirate enterprise no, that's interconnected. Yeah. No, not only is she. Yeah, like have this you, enterprise. You had She's, Blackbeard ship. Yeah, not yeah. Blackbeard Beard enterprises. And we, fleet. yeah. I mean, this is this is, you know, prohibition mafia style, where like she's got all kinds of legitimate businesses that are funneling money into the pirate enterprise, in addition to well, the raping and pillaging. Eventually, you get big enough that you can do things legally and make more money. <laughs> yeah, very, very much so. Um, she also implements her pirate code of laws, and this is to unite. All the pirates underneath that 1805 agreement, she writes these new laws after uh, Cheng Yat dies to ensure that she stays superior and everybody follows her whim. Yeah, that's pretty pretty standard for somebody taking over something like this. So the And these were strictly enforced. The first law is anyone giving their own orders or disobeying those orders of a superior was to be beheaded on the spot. So if you don't follow my order, off with your head. Or giving their, wow. or giving their own orders, okay, like without. But that, that's not like that would hey, be like you need to go mop the deck. That's like if they start taking over, like it would it would basically be like rob. you know if a captain of another ship goes off and does his own thing without approval of yeah Cheng Shi and now your head's gone off with your head. Oh, by the way, uh, her name becomes Cheng Shi when uh, Cheng Yat dies, and it means widow of Cheng. Ah, yeah. So well, that's nice. So, so she didn't kill him. Yeah, right? Yeah, she took his name as Widow, you know, it's fine. Yeah. Um, the second rule is that no one was to steal from the public fund or villagers that supplied the pirates. So at this time, a lot of the, a lot of the ports... <laughs> they in set up a South, tax system, yeah, sounds like. exactly. Um, <laughs> all goods taken as booty had to be presented for group inspection. Uh, the original Caesar would receive 20% and the rest being placed into a common fleet-wide public fund. Well, this is never going to work. That's socialism time. It is, but it, but this is kind of why their fleet stays as powerful as long as it does. But it, but it, it's socialism, Tommy. I know, Johnny. But it, it, it worked in this smaller scale, I huh. guess. Like, that's weird. Because what happens hard here to, is... Hard to imagine. If, if you have one ship, this is why it works for her. Uh, if you have... <laughs> If you have one ship that has a bad raid, you know, doesn't get it much money, yeah. they're still being able to be supplied by the rest of the larger fleet. Or if huh. a ship gets taken out by the Shing Dynasty's navy, it's not the whole fleet destroyed. It's not yeah, a loss or, of everything. Yeah, or if, like, one ship has, like, just an awesome raid that, you know, they don't just 
become the richest ship and then just keep nope. it all on their it ship. Just, it gets spread out between everybody. Huh. And that that worked? It, it, well, it worked for this Enterprise. That's hard to imagine. I mean, granted, it doesn't work for, uh, like, forever, because we'll get well, there. Well, they're pirates. They're pirates, <laughs> yeah. Something's going to happen, forever. right? You're, you're a pirate. <laughs> yeah. And the last rule is that any uh, uh, actual money, like actual tangible money, would be turned over to the squadron leader, who would uh, only give a small amount back to the seizure, uh, but and this was to ensure that supplies can be purchased for the entire fleet. It's a yeah. lot easier to purchase fish and water and yeah, rum. One person goes to with the cash. Store. Yeah, one person goes to the store and they have the money to do it, as opposed to walking in with like yeah. looted <laughs> TVs and be like, "I, I have wanna... these jewels that uh, <laughs> surely I can trade for." Right. Yeah. Um, like I said, by doing this, it ensured the mutual fleet cooperation and success because everybody was dependent upon everybody else. And I even have in my notes here, Johnny, dirty, dirty communism. Because <laughs> my mind went to the same place. These socialists. Burn them. Um, the fleet size at this point is where she begins, She gets known as the, having the largest fleet because okay, she's in charge yeah. of, of all the pirates. And it's estimated between 25,000 and 70,000 pirates. I mean, at the time, that was like... That was that is a big, massive army. It was like the top, it was one of the top three, right? Like oh yeah, top three in size, like compared to like Ever. Britain and China. Yeah, yeah, for the like, for the navy. Yeah, yeah. right, right, yeah. Because because yeah. to keep in keep in mind, the U.S. Navy at this time was well under that twenty five thousand oh, yeah, mark. Yeah. We were God, well yeah. under that. Yeah, uh, and e even Britain's army was not was it. it it was not much bigger than that. If it was no, it, it it Britain's navy was the largest, but it wasn't like but yeah, this substantially was, larger. Yeah, this, this was, was close. Yeah, en enough that they could go in and mess with Britain if they wanted to. Yes, and 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 they do and, right. And well, maybe? well, Britain Britain gets sent to mess with them, and it doesn't ah, go okay. go in Britain's I favor. I knew they had something yeah. to do. Yeah, I saw something so, there. The final, final, final rule that she makes uh, is uh, no more rape. I mean, yeah. As a woman, I can under you know well not me as a woman, but her yes, being a woman, right, I definitely right. understand where this comes from. Um, she she decreed that all sex had to be consensual, and not only did all sex have to be consensual, but the, any pirate engaging in uh, consensual extramarital affairs would be subject to flogging, clapping in irons, or even beheading. So basically, you you okay. you don't follow any of my rules. Off with your damn head! And she offed plenty of heads. Yeah. I mean, which is kind of ridiculous because you'd think she would only have to off one or two before you realize, you know what? She means it. She, I'm going to not. <laughs> I'm going to not do it. <laughs> I'm, I'm going to just listen. Yeah. It, it, like, took a, it took a little bit of head. I, know, I, would, I, to, I know me. After I would, one. I would have fallen in line. Yeah. Pretty like quickly. right after the first yeah. head. I don't. You know what? I don't even need to see the no, first head get lobbed off. It would have been like, if you violate my laws, your head's going to be lobbed off. Yeah. I'd be like, I, okay, I see that that's, that you're capable of that, making that happen. I'm done. Yep. Like what, what, yep. what, what would you like me to do? <laughs> I will become a yes man so damn fast. <laughs> yep. My wife threatens me with 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 like just not talking to me, and I'm the biggest <laughs> yes man in the world. <laughs> um. So, like I said, in addition to the the pirating enterprises, uh, she did get a, the fishing trade up and running. She was a part of the silk trade, salt trade, opium trade, and plenty of plenty of racketeering along local, you know. Yeah. Gambling houses, that right. kind of stuff. Yep. Yeah, just went and did whatever she wanted, yep. sounds like. Pretty much. Got her fingers into everything. And... Uh, they also began operating their own local governments off the uh, the southern coast of China. <laughs> they would not? go into these smaller cities uh, and, well, this is ours now, and would institute a system of levies and taxes on these coastal uh, cities uh, that were ruled by the Xing Dynasty uh, who also bowed to them because they were just being bribed off. The Xing Dynasty, A, didn't have the power to deal with them, really. And B, well, right. yeah. sure, yeah. yeah, pay us and we're, we're good. Yeah, we, we went ahead and collected these taxes from this city that we you know, went ahead and occupied, and they're now protecting, like, I'm guessing they offer the city protection yes, yeah, in yeah. exchange. Well, and as one of the first rules was, you, and... you cannot rape and pillage a city that, that yeah. pays into us, that supports yeah, us. Yeah, so, you know, as a little farming village, they're probably going to be welcoming of this pirate well, community. Yeah, no more rape and pillage. Yeah, I mean, it's either that or the government coming in. And, they're, and, you know, <laughs> and it's the same, and it's the same thing. going to come in and take all your money from you. Like, <laughs> that's just, you know what? It might as well be the, the person that's like, all right, don't rape anybody. <laughs> Historic hindsight, rule number one. Somebody is always going to come in and take your money. It doesn't <laughs> matter what yeah. or who. Somebody's taking your damn money. Um, the Qing Dynasty... Shit's starting to escalate at this point, though. 
Um, they would actually wind up enlisting the, the help of the Portuguese Navy and British Navy as bounty hunters to go after Ching Shi. They realized that they're getting too big. Yeah, it, we, we got <laughs> like, to uh, knock them down a little bit. Uh, and uh, for the first few years, it actually doesn't go in the British or Portuguese favor. It's like they send one or two ships and get their right. ass kicked yeah. and they go, oh shit, we actually have to... Wait, how many people did they have? <laughs> <laughs> we have to take them a little bit more seriously. And at this point, uh, in kind of retribution, uh, Qing Shi begins a successful military campaign against the Xing Dynasty, uh, even using ground forces to overtake local governors. So they're like going from sea to land. Now. Sea to land. They're now invading the southern coast of China. Yeah. Well, I can see why China's now like not happy um, about it. We wanted to have control over all those cities and all that money and resources. Yeah, and then uh, it. it it escalates uh, to a point where in January 1808, uh, she winds up killing a very popular uh, high provincial commander mm -hmm. in, in, in one of the uh, one of the provinces. So you you can't that would be like going off and assassinating a congressman. You uh, I mean, to you're going to get noticed. To be fair, she'd been killing so many people. I'm guessing like it's hard to find that line. <laughs> well, she sounds like she found it. She found it. She found it. So the, that the, guy. the Xing dynasty was like, all right, look, this, we've, this really has to stop. So they sent a uh, military governor by the name of Bai Ling uh, to put an end to all of this. Uh, Bai Ling's first uh, mode of stopping this was, Hey, can you guys just stop? I Here's mean, some money. Please just stop. Yeah. You, if you don't ask, you'll never know. You'll never know. And he does, all the way back from 1808, tries to negotiate a truce with, with the pirates just by starting off slow increments of paying <laughs> them off. Pretty please. <laughs> Pretty please stop. Uh, Ching Shi responds uh, to this with a full-scale assault of the Pearl River Delta, specifically the rich port city of Canton. So that's going to so be a no. She goes, nope, <laughs> we're good. I'm just going to you know, take your richest city and rape and pillage it over the next full year. In 1809, the Xing Dynasty begins to discuss paying well, off the just pirates. Well, pillage it, though, right? Yeah, well, yeah, pillage it. Well, they're not, yeah, they're, I mean, they're not raping anybody yeah. anymore. It's just so, pillaging. They're just pillaging. Tommy. Pillaging, I'm sorry. Sorry, sorry, guys. Tommy, it's 1809. Sorry. Right. Get with the time. Just pillaging. Uh, <laughs> the Xing Dynasty begins to, again, increase the, the, the ideas of paying them off, increase the, the volume of money that they would give them, and also in, enlist more foreign aid. Specifically, they, at this point, they just pay for the entire Portuguese fleet. Like, look, go to war with the, go to war with the pirates. Yeah. And Portugal's like, deal. All right. You gonna pay us? Who's, and Portugal's also one of the, one of the other top, like, five largest navies, so they have the means to do this. Yeah. Um, and at this time in 1809, Qing Shi does begin some discussions with the Qing dynasty about, yeah, maybe, maybe, maybe it is time to retire a little bit. Yeah, she's starting to realize that maybe it's getting a little too big, too. Well, only because uh, in September and November of 1809, uh, Cheng Po suffers a series of defeats at, by the Portuguese navies yeah. at the Battle of Tiger's Mouth. Uh, eventually, Cheng Po himself would, would wind up surrendering his portion of the fleet to the Portuguese Navy at the Battle of uh, Chek Lap Pau, or Chek, Chek Lap Coke, 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 whatever. Anyways, it doesn't matter. He winds up surrendering on January 21st, 1810. Yeah, so, well, yeah, they started realizing they're bringing in the big... The big guns. guns and they're just going to keep. No. Like, and that's the thing about governments versus pirates. Like, the governments, they're just going to keep. Coming. bringing more yeah and more and more you know and, and pirates are going to eventually run out of resources run, yeah, yeah yeah um so of the approximate seventeen thousand three hundred eighteen pirates that were left underneath chung po's command uh in the part of these surrendering negotiations which again still goes to the level of how awesome these pirates were because you'd think everybody's gonna be put to death right johnny or, or there's gonna I be mean, some degree of punishment I right mean, there's gotta be something you uh, can't just let them get away with years of piratry well, Cheng Po successfully negotiated that only 60 pirates would be banished uh, yep. from Portuguese seas, uh, 151 would be exiled from Portuguese seas, and 126 would be put to death. So the vast majority of pirates, eh, you're good. I'm going to bet she handpicked all those. I'm going to bet it was the ones that were raping and pillaging. Yeah. And not yeah, just and she's just like, uh, tell you what, this is how many. <laughs> he's a dick, do. he's a dick, he's yeah, a dick, he's see. a dick, everybody else is yep. cool. Dead, 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 exiled. You guys banished, and how many is that? Okay, that'll be the negotiation. That's it. And I wonder how she negotiated this. <laughs> 
Well, uh, after this defeat, she d she does think it's time to seriously negotiate with the, with the Xing Dynasty because yeah, things aren't exactly going in her favor. But she intentionally continues to raid the Xing Dynasty so that that offer continues to get tipped more and more and more into her favor. Right. On April 8th, 1810, she winds up docking in Canton and meets with Bai Ling to surrender. She says, All right, I'm ready to surrender. Her terms, she slides across the table, uh, were laughably in favor of the pirates, including full amnesty and the ability to keep all plundered goods and money. So basically, she says, look, I'm going to stop raping and pillaging, but you, uh, we're... What I've taken, I guess. It's mine. Yeah, I'm just going to And be you're not going to charge us with any crime. Yeah, I'm just done moving forward. Uh, it's just dissolved, and, and we just all walk our own way. Yep. Uh, that sounds uh, like a good deal. Byling was all like, uh, yeah, that sounds like an awful deal. Why would I ever possibly agree to this? At, at which point, Ching Shi was all like, okay, and ordered the pirates to ravish the area. And again, <laughs> raided Canton for like the second time. Oh, God, so uh, so badass. obviously Bai Ling being a badass himself was like no this is ridiculous I'm going to fight you to death or he actually just caved into every one of her demands and in exchange for surrendering the pirates would avoid any type of punishment whatsoever keep the loot keep a portion of their ships and receive government employment yeah people just realize that she's insane and will ruin your life no matter what yep. yeah <laughs> she does i would like these things no you can't have them okay <sighs> gonna come in and just wreck your city can i have them now yep uh it's just cheaper to I pay say, off Yeah, because what if what if you say no again <laughs> I, it's gonna get worse <laughs> exactly in exchange for this negotiated uh peace uh chung po would be given the rank of colonel and given 30 ships and allowed to retain 30 private fleets under the Xing dynasty so he would actually go on to be one of the heads of the navy of the Xing Dynasty. I mean, that's fair though. He's proven hey, that he, he knows. He's how proven to that he's it. a badass. Like so. it, you know, it's not you know. A lot of times you see these, you know, people get these jobs high up in the ranks, and it's not deserved. But he's allowed to have. This is like, well earned. He's got. He's got. And, and then his own. Fleet. His his own fleet. Yeah, he's got <laughs> What's thirty. He do with that? He's, he's, he's got that? thirty government owned ships, and then thirty private owned ships that are his. <laughs> I, all right. Well, for the licensed pirating that he's able to do, what against Chinese emperor, you know, oh, okay. enemies, yeah, you know. Sure. So the side side hustle. Um, Xing Shi and uh, Cheng Po would actually wind up going to the Guangdong uh, governor uh, Zhang Bailing and uh, ask him to dissolve their mother son relationship, which he did, and then they would yeah. be married and witnessed by Zhang Bailong um, himself. So. Governor not only dissolved their adopted decree, he married them, and then was like the guy who married them. Yeah, so, pretty, I mean, one stop shop. One stop shop. Um, uh, Cheng Shi and Cheng Po would wind up having a, a son of their own, uh, Cheng Yu Lin, in eighteen thirteen, and a daughter unknown, oh, because China. Because <laughs> because what? Which is so ridiculous because we spent this entire episode talking about how badass a badass woman, she is. woman. But we have no idea who her daughter don't was. Don't care about her daughter. Because, yeah. of course, the daughter can never grow up to do anything spectacular or noteworthy. <laughs> right. Um, unfortunately, uh, uh, Chung Po, he would wind up dying in 1822 um, at sea, uh, you know, in a naval battle. Yeah. Uh, in, the, in, in Ching Shi would wind up moving the whole family to Macau. And open up a gambling house and brothel. Hey, full circle. Full circle. And she also continued a little bit of the racketeering uh, on the side uh, with with a lot of interest in the salt trade. Well, you know, once you get involved with that, I heard it's really hard to get out of it. You gotta keep it. But this was all government sanctioned, so meh, she was okay with it. Yeah. Uh, she would serve as, also would wind up serving as a military advisor to Lin Zhu uh, against the British army during the Opium Wars. So not only is she such a badass that she was able to get away with so, all of the shit that she did, the government, when they got into war with Britain, was like, hey, can you can you help us? I love the idea of her sitting in her brothel and then getting, you know, a knock on the door and someone coming in and be like, hey, we need you to get back in the game. Yeah, can you, uh, <laughs> can you come you, and you can, come you sit, can you sit down here for us and, and help us out a little <laughs> it's bit? Like, it's like a heist movie. 
Like, oh, I'm out of the game. Oh, we need you for one last, one last battle. <laughs> they need to make, they need to make, she's been in like movies and stuff, but it, none of them has ever been like really giving her any one. credit. So she really needs her own damn movie. Yeah. And make it like this, but, but I want it like after she's already raped and pillaged. I want the buddy, I want the buddy cop, like, the, we need the, you to get back in the game. Back in. Yeah, you want to come and see what she did during, you know, during the opium wars. <laughs> yeah, exactly. <laughs> she would wind up dying peacefully in her sleep uh, on 18, or in 1844, surrounded by her family. So, God damn. she lived a long, good, successful life. I mean, find me another pirate that actually didn't get killed, like, you know, outright as being a pirate, let alone somebody who was so successful that the government was like, yeah, we'll give you a pass if you just stop. Yeah. We hope you enjoyed this episode of Historic Hindsight. Every week we take a look at some of the major events that took place during this week in a segment that we like to call This Week in History. All right, so Johnny, in, the, in this week's history, we're going to start off with a with a, a quite a big whoopsie. <laughs> uh, so. Um, on March 1st, 1954, the U.S. would explode uh, Castle Brave, a 15 megaton hydrogen bomb. What? Yep. So we're testing this. This is an extra megaton. 15 megaton hydrogen bomb. This was in test. So it was intentional that we detonated the bomb. Sure. Not quite so intentional how big it became. We, we were surprised that a 15 megaton bomb was as large as it was. The explosion was as large? Uh, we were surprised that it was 15 megatons. Ah. That was what surprised That was a whoopsie. So uh, it was the first in a series of high-yield thermal nuclear weapon design tests conducted by the U.S. at Bikini Atoll, Marshall Islands. It was a part of Operation Castle, which was to test a quote-unquote dry-yield nuclear device and an aircraft capable of carrying them. So as opposed to the wet... Yeah, I, don't, I really uh, don't know yeah. the difference between dry uh, and wet-yield. It's, it's, it's a different type of fission core as opposed to what sure. we had been using. So it used uh, lithium uh, deuteride. Mm -hmm. Hey, look, I got a science term right. Uh, as the fuel and was estimated to produce uh, six megatons of TNT or equivalent to six megatons sure. of TNT. That's what it was supposed to do. Okay. Uh, the, the first one that they tested was kind of a dud and didn't do anything at all. This was their second, second bomb test. The bomb detonated, but it actually wound up producing 2.5 times the prediction at 15 megatons and inadvertently spread radioactive contaminants all across the Bikini Atoll, dropping radioactive material on citizens of uh, Ronglape and Uteric Atolls, which weren't evacuated until three days later. <laughs> so, uh, Sorry, guys. You have all been uh, contaminated with radioactivity. And, but we uh, wait three days to tell you. Now, if you could leave. That'd be great. That'd be great. Because yep. then it won't get worse, I guess. So, yeah, the Bikini Atoll as a part of the Marshall Islands was was evacuated for a test. Like, it became its own. It used to be, like, a resort destination, but it became well, a testing site. until they site. started bombing it yeah. with a bunch of nuclear... And then, you know, yeah. the islands around it were supposed to be safe because these bombs weren't supposed to be that large and weren't supposed to spread that much radiation. No, they, people just thought they would be because they had no idea what the hell they were doing. Y yep. <laughs> That's what, it wasn't, oh, that'll be safe because I calculated how far this is supposed to spread. No, that's why they were blowing them up, because they had no idea. Yeah, they had no idea. So the, uh, the, the U.S. Department of Energy estimated that 253 inhabitants of the Marshall Islands around Bikini Atoll were impacted with addition of 23 crew members from a nearby Japanese fishing vessel that got too close. And again, whoops. Uh, man. The Japanese, Japanese radiation exposure does not go well. <laughs> Ah, you just can't escape it, can you? Nope. Uh, the uh, the female population to this day in the Marshall Islands is estimated to have 60 times greater mortality rate from cervical cancer oh, Jesus. Uh, than the comparable mainland population. Whoops again. So um, a little bit, little bit happier now, or maybe not, I guess, depending on how you want to look at it. The first meeting of the U.S. Congress happens on this day, on March 4th, uh, 1789. So this is the, the very first meeting of the Congress of the newly founded Constitution, which replaces the, you know, the Articles of Confederation. Yay. Yay. So uh, it consisted of the United States Senate and House of Representatives, like it does today. And they would meet from March 4th to March 3rd of, of 1791. So March 4th, 1789, all the way up to March 3rd, 1791. That's the first official session of congress it's a but, long ass meeting yeah but but much like today johnny they did not meet that entire time that 
That's did did they meet at any point in time during that entire time? A couple. Yeah, they sure did. They sure did when they when they didn't have their vacation days. So this was uh this was, you know, during the first 2 years of the Washington of Washington's presidency, so his first term. Uh, and it was split into three sections. So this was our three meeting sections. The first section uh, happened from March 4th, 1789 to September 29th, 1789. So, you know, a couple months. Uh, then again from January 4th, 1790 to August 12th, 1790. And then again from December 6th, 1790 to March 3rd, 1791. So basically, we're only working a couple of months out of the time. So, yeah, you know. It's government. It's today's Congress. Government work. Yeah, exactly. Um, they'd first uh, met in Federal Hall in New York City, and then later moved it down to Congress Hall in Philadelphia. This is obviously before we ever built the you right. know, Constitutional Building, whatever the hell Con Congressional Hall is. I think that's the official name. Carnegie know. Hall? No, that's a little bit different. Oh. Um, <clears throat> it, officially, the uh, uh, they met under the current frame of the Constitution, which uh, which was established in 1787 and wasn't fully ratified yet. So basically the first part of this meeting was to actually ratify the beginning portions of the Constitution and get the government officially up and running. There were 22 to 26 senators that were a part of this whole ordeal through the, through the two-year span there, and 59 to 65 members of the House. So some fun things that this government did not protect uh, as of yet, um, you know, that our current constitutional frame protects that it didn't. Um, at this time, the presidential, vice presidential elections hadn't been set up yet, so we have no idea on how to elect them. So well, hopefully you know, one, one day we'll figure that we'll out. We'll figure that out. Uh, slavery is obviously still legal at this point. There are absolutely no provisions in this constitution for voting rights. So it's not a, well, even today, voting is not guaranteed. It's not in the Constitution as a guaranteed thing. Only you can't discriminate against people I mean, to vote. This seems pretty obviously white men can vote. Nobody else can. Well, yeah, but that's it's not that's not it, even explicitly. They yeah, well, they don't have to spell it out because yeah. that's the way it is. Yep. I mean, why would it be any different? Sure is. Uh, there is no explicit uh, establishment of citizenship, so citizens don't even exist yet according to the Constitution at this time. Fair. Uh, there's no federal income tax, which you know that probably we should just go back to that. No. Yeah. I don't need federal tax. Damn it, Johnny, I want my monies. It's my monies, and I want it now. I like my roads and shit. Nah, well, fair enough, I guess. Uh, there's no comp uh, congressional compensation, so Congress isn't getting paid. So, also not I mean, necessarily a bad thing. why is that different? Huh? That, that should... I'm fine going back to that. Yeah, that we should probably go back to that. Uh, there are, at this time, are no... You want to serve our government? Serve. Yeah. All right, it's a volunteer thing. Yeah. Fuck your six-figure salary. <laughs> <laughs> yep. Uh, so there are uh, also no term limits on president or Congress, which, of course, there's still no term limits on Congress. That also should change. Also should change, yep. And that's that's just to name a few things that the Constitution at the beginning didn't actually protect. But we have a little bit more of those protections now. Or Yay. bad things oh, now. Had. Yay. Had. Have. Depending on when have. you're listening to this. Yeah, who knows? Anything can change tomorrow. <laughs> so our last thing up here, uh, Johnny, is a happy note i guess if you're a texan sort of why, why are all these like provisional like some they might they're happy if you well think like a certain way. the first meeting of congress is happy if you Just think of bring, it a certain well, way. i feel like you got to start bringing one good thing well this. congress meeting of the congress that's a good thing that's a good Our thing. government oh, that's is a founded. boring thing sort of okay well, all right whatever this is this is okay What's so this? the the siege of alamo was concluded on march 6 1836 so uh, uh, the, the siege, remember. remember the Alamo. So if you don't remember the Alamo, it was a siege that lasted from February 23rd to March 6th and uh, at the Alamo mission in, in modern day San Antonio and was part of the Texas uh, rebellion from Mexico. So in a nutshell, uh, what had happened is Mexico owned Texas. Mexico thought, hey, it'd be a really cool idea if we go ahead and allow white Americans to settle in Texas to help us farm and shit because it's <laughs> a big place and we Oops. need some help with crops. You know, they're going to be Mexican. You know, you, you can immigrate in here. You become a Mexican. You can take up some of the jobs that we don't want to do, like picking fruit. Had Mexico not been paying attention to what white people were doing everywhere they went? Uh, apparently not, because they let them come in. And then, of course, when the Americans came into Texas, they were like, Said, oh, look, this is ours. Oh, look, Turns this, out. Oh, oh, look, this is ours. We should be our own. We're white, and we don't like you brown people, so we should be our own independent nation. And they started the Texas Rebellion against Mexico. That's been going on since. 
pretty much yeah yeah pretty much um <laughs> damn it johnny you got me <laughs> uh the, so this is a part of that whole thing uh basically the texas rebellion the texans uh kicked the shit out of the mexican army that was in mexico at the time <laughs> to start things off with uh, and then they decided hey that whole alamo mission thing that little church seems like a good place to hold up a fort and so you know they hang out there they're drinking their whiskeys they're having a good time we just kicked the shit out of the mexicans what could possibly go wrong um but you know mexico didn't really like being pushed out you don't say no so the mission was initially occupied by 100 texans uh but the numbers slightly get boosted when you know the americans realize or i'm sorry the texans realize that yeah the mexicans were coming back they're like hey maybe we need to arm up more than a hundred man army. So they, they ask for fellow immigrants, both legal and illegal to, uh, to assist. And then of course the Americans to assist. Uh, and then their numbers get slightly boosted up to, you know, between 185 to 260 people. And we're going to have to go back a little bit. Hello. How's it going? How's your day? Good. Good. We're gonna finish up real quick, Eric. I don't know where you were. I'll start over with the, the mission, I guess. Okay. Or do you want to just hold, do the whole Alamo thing over again? Uh, no, I don't think Not you the do mission. that. All right, so the mission was initially occupied by 100 Texans. Uh, the numbers would eventually be boosted slightly by uh, American immigrants, both legal and illegal, including James Bowie, Davy Crockett. Uh, and their numbers were um, boosted up to. David Bowie? James, James Bowie. Bowie. Not David Bowie. Davy Crockett, James Bowie. Oh, okay. I said it right, I think. You did. Yeah, you just got confused. David Bowie wasn't mm. around yet. Mm. Well, maybe. David Bowie's kind of timeless. He is a little timeless. Yeah, so so James uh, James Bowie, or Bowie, sorry, it should probably be pronounced Bowie, Bowie Knife, Bowie, it's Bowie. Oh. All right, let's start this over again. Okay. So the mission was initially occupied by 100 Texans, uh, but the numbers were slightly boosted by uh, illegal American immigrants, including James Bowie and Davy Crockett. The numbers get up to about 185 to 260 at the Alamo. So they doubled it. They doubled it. Seems on, like enough. On, on, it seems like enough. On February 23rd, Antonio Lopez de Santa Ana uh, would arrive with 1,800 Mexican soldiers and, you know, say, look, you can't kick us out. It's our country. Knock it off. Yeah. Yeah. So realizing that he was fucked, uh, the leader of the Texans was William Travis. He requested aid from fellow Texans, uh, other illegal and legal immigrants, and the U.S. government. The U.S. government <laughs> says, mm, we're going to sit this one out because we actually just signed a peace treaty with Mexico. And if we get involved, it's going to be an act of war. And we don't really want that right now. It's really weird that Texas would try to become its own nation and then all of a sudden need the American government again. <laughs> right? Weird. Uh, and so, so America's like, nah, we're good. We're bow out. But like I said, their, their numbers get slightly bolstered or doubled, doubled the numbers, but they're still heavily, heavily, heavily outnumbered. Um, but being a Texan, Travis refuses to leave the mission. And on March 9th, Santa Ana would advance on the Alamo. Or March 6th, sorry, would advance on the Alamo. Uh, the Texans would repeal two of the three initial assaults by Santa Ana. Uh, and then once Santa Ana actually takes over on the third assault, he basically just slaughters everybody else that's left. Hmm. Says, I'll teach you for, you know, having a rebellion, like you tend to do. Most countries, when they yeah. have somebody rebel against them, they tend to, like, you know, stamp you, out that rebellion. You squash the rebellion. Yep. Yeah. So approximately 182 to 257, depending on what sources you read, Texans will die, including Davy Crockett and James Bowie. Uh, while 600 Mexicans were killed or wounded during this assault. So, again, this proves that defending a place is a hell of a lot easier than attacking yeah. it, because they killed way more people than, you know, than they lost. No, well, they still lost, though. They they very much did lose this one. There's that. Uh, but, however, since Santa Ana was very ruthless and, you know, executed at this point, unarmed surrendered POWs, right. yeah. uh, the slaughter of the Alamo actually encouraged a bunch of angry Texans, and then a month later, uh, they would ban their own army and defeat Santa Ana at the Battle of San uh, Juancito, and the U.S. would uh, would ignore the treaty a decade later and start the Mexican-American War and take Texas for their own in 1846. I love that it took them a decade to realize what? that allowing them to just murder unarmed people is not okay. Well, it was more like, 
we want to wait to see if Texan can actually, or Texas can actually, you know, beat the Mexicans. And then, yeah. oh, this band of rednecks, for lack of a better yeah. word, were able to beat the Mexican army. We could probably do it too. Hey, California seems like it'd be pretty cool to own. Why don't we go over and take Mexico and just take California and Nevada and Arizona oh, and this Texas looks nice. with it? Flag. Flag. And that's this week in history. <laughs>